Good morning, Kahal Kadosh. Shavua Tovu Meborach. Today is Sunday, the fifth day of Menachem Av, corresponding to the 23rd of July. Today's class for the entire week as well, graciously sponsored by Morris Cheva and family, Le'ilui Nishmat, his beloved father, Ishak Ben Hana, Mr. Isaac Cheva, Alava Shalom. Additionally, by Yaakov Kobi Cohen for the entire week, Le'ilui Nishmat, his beloved grandmother, Yakut Bat Freha, Aleha Shalom, Iratzon, that to the words of Torah, the Neshamot have an aliyah in Gan Eden. Amen. So I know that this is the week of Tisha Ve'av, subject to change, Be'ezat Hashem, but also today, Sunday, is the yard side of Rabbeinu Ha'ari, Rabbeinu Ishaq Luria. So therefore, we are going to be learning today about the life of this great giant. I believe that Rabbeinu Ha'ari really does not need uh, my introduction. Rabbeinu Ha'ari is very close to us because a lot of the things that we do in our life, a lot of the traditions that we do in our life, even the Siddur that we use uh, in our life, it's based on the text of Rabbeinu Ha'ari HaKadosh. Rabbeinu Ha'ari, I'll give you some of the background introduction on the life of Rabbeinu Ha'ari. Rabbeinu Ha'ari was known as Rabbeinu Ishaq Luria Ashkenazi. Now, it's a debate if actually he was Ashkenazi or Sephardi. He was born in Eres Israel in Yerushalayim, Ayra Kodesh, in the year 1534. Regretfully, he passed away in the year 1572. That means that he only lived 38 years in this world. But what he accomplished in 38 years probably will take a person 380 years to achieve his holiness and godliness. So when he was a young child, he became an orphan. His father passed away and his mother moved to Egypt. Who lived in Egypt? Rabbeinu Besalel Ashkenazi. Who was Rabbeinu Besalel Ashkenazi? He was a great giant of Torah who lived in Egypt, who was the uncle of Rabbeinu Ha'ari, and he was the author of Shita Mekubeset. If you are a yeshiva student, you are familiar with the Shita Mekubeset. It's a ma mandatory Torah learning book which brings commentaries on the uh, Talmud. Also, he was raised in the Bet Midrash of the Ritbaz. Ritbaz was David David Ben Zimbra, also a great Sephardic giant who lived in Egypt, and he was, we can say, one of the main teachers of Rabbeinu Ha'ari that taught him not only the Torah, the Nigla, but also the Torah Hanistar. Nigla means the reveal aspects of Torah, Gemara, Halachot, Mishnayot, Shulchan Aruch, etc. And Nistar means all the hidden Kabbalistic aspects of uh, life. Uh, when he was 15 years old, David, what is David? He married his cousin. Relax. You finish high school and learn. He was in the Gemara class that we were debating yesterday how young the person should be to get married, right? But Rabbeinu Ari got married at the age of 15. Now, I'm not telling you to do this. Obviously, the 15 back then is probably 22, 23, 25 of today. But just to show how certain Saddikim, okay, literally took this concept of the Gemara in Masechet Kiddushin in a very serious uh, note. So it says that one of the goals in life of Rabbeinu Ha'ari that he developed throughout his life were two aspects of life. One is called Hid Bodedut, the other one is called Perishut. Now, what's the meaning of these two words? The word Hid Bodedut is a very common word in our vocabulary today. We see it in the Torah when his Hakavino the Pasuk says, by Yesei is Hak Lasuah Basade, is Hakavino went out to the fields to talk to Akadosh Baruchu. So it bodedud 
it's basically a moment of solitude. What does it mean, solitude? A moment that a person by themselves, no one around them, talks to Akadosh Baruch Hu. In our days, this is a very popular uh, concept that people do. And also, the topic, the topic of Perishut slash Tahara. What's the meaning of Perishut? Perishut meant separation from the luxuries of life okay for example we now not eating meat for a few days it's not a lot we made the calculation thursday friday sunday monday tuesday wednesday thursday so seven days we don't eat meat that's it meat because of shabayab for echa okay but can you imagine you never eat meat throughout the week, but once a week. Certain mekubalim, that's how they do. And I'll tell you a secret. Some mekubalim don't even eat meat. They only eat chicken. Because it's less kashut problem. Chicken than meat. And those in a heavy weight, not even chicken. Fish only. That's called perishut. No, but don't, don't, do this. don't try this at home. You eat chicken, you eat meat, not this week. But there were certain sadikim, certain mekubalim, that they had perishut. In other words, I'm, gonna, I'm explaining. I'm explaining. Thank you, thank you. Tranquilo. Now, what's the meaning of perishut? Perishut means separation from the luxuries that life brings upon the person. You live a simpler way of life why because the more luxurious the person lifestyle is the more distant the person becomes from a kadosh baruchu this is a reality of life doesn't matter who you are simplicity keeps life better you have to work less you enjoy your parnasa better but if you're always running to keep up with luxury so you're never happy because you always want more. You always want more. You always need more. Not because eh, 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 you need you have a larger family, but because you live an expensive lifestyle that brings upon you more demands of financial needs. So there were certain sadikim who really tried to tighten the belt and live a simpler way of life. It says that later on in life, through an encounter with Eliyahu and Navi, prior to his passing, El, 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 Rabbeinu Hari made the move to the city of Sfat, in which he transferred a lot of the Torah that he knew to the one and only Rabbeinu Haim Vital. Rabbeinu Haim Vital was one of the, perhaps, foremost students of Rabbeinu Hari. One of the teachers of Rabbeinu Ha'ari when he arrived in the city of Sfat was the famous Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, the Ramak, the author of Tomer Devorah, Pardes Remonim, that we spoke about him in the past. So we need to understand that even today, if you go to the city of Sfat, which I can imagine that a day like today, thousands are visiting the cavern of Rabbeinu Ha'ari, and I'm not exaggerating. Thousands go to Tzfat on a day like today to visit the Arizal. Now, if you ever went to the cavern of the Ari, you are going to see which today is, uh, for example, here I have a picture. How did this look 20 years ago? Open space. Kevarim are painted in blue. This is an old picture from an old book at least 20 years old. But today, it's a different ball game. Today, they put a tent, they put an awning, they put a bridge, they put steps, so you're able to come from the top of the mountain where the mikveh of Rabbeinu Hari is, that is freezing cold. If you go to that mikveh, guaranteed you do teshuvah before you leave the world. True, you do teshuvah when you come out of that pool alive. I went there several times. Freezing cold is at the bottom of the mountain, freezing cold, but doesn't matter 
you know, how often do we ever go to the mikveh of Rabbeinu Hari? Maybe I went 10 times in my life, but every time I travel to the holy city of Sfat, I bring my towel and I go to the mikveh of Rabbeinu Hari. I repeat, it's freezing cold. It's up to you if you want to be freezing cold just for a few seconds, literally. And uh, what happens? So when you go to the kever of Rabbeinu Hari, it's like one step. Because what do you have in that section? You have Rabbeinu Hari, you have Rabbeinu Shelomo Lebi Al Kabetz, the one who composed Lechad or the Likrat Kala, the composer of that prayer. Then you have Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, all of them in the same row. And then you have to the left, I believe, you have Rabbi Eliezer Askari, which was the composer of Sefer Haredim. So it's one stop shopping. You go Sefer Haredim, Rabbeinu Hari, eh, Rabbeinu Shalom Lebi Al Kabetz, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero. A few feet down is Rabbeinu Yosef Karo, the author of the Shuhan Aruch. A couple of feet down, you have the eh, Rabbeinu Moshe Al Sheikh, the one who wrote the Al Sheikh commentary on the Torah. So you have these mega sadikim that they all live more or less in the same generations, some a years later, some years earlier. This, all this mega uh, a dynamic group of Mekubalim, they were, some of them immigrated from Spain because this chapter of Kabbalistic channel in the city of Sfat became activated after the Inquisition in Spain. The Inquisition in Spain was 1492, and the era of the Mekubalim was the early 1500s, hence the name Rebi Moshe Cordovero. Where Cordovero comes from? From Cordova. Rabbeinu Yosef Caro also comes from Spain. Rabbeinu Ari was the exception. But most of the Mekubalim were descendants of people that survived the Inquisition. And this is a Kadosh Baruch Hu, so to speak, rewarding the parents for escaping the Inquisition. Because you need to understand, when it came to the Inquisition, unfortunately, you had choices. But the choices were not the best. One choice was to be killed because you don't want to become a Christian. The next thing that people did was become Anusim. Externally, they converted Maranos, Anusim. See, they became Anusim. They converted externally, but internally they remained Jewish, right? And then you had those that left Spain. But when you left Spain, remember that you left empty-handed. You couldn't sell your assets. You gave up everything you had. And in order to leave Spain, you needed to pay a tax. This was part of the decrees of the uh, Inquisition. Uh, for those who established Inquisition. And therefore, those families who really left Spain and they gave, they gave up all their wealth, because that was the only way of leaving Spain. If you wanted to leave Spain as a Jew, you needed to leave Spain empty-handed. You... At this moment, we need to be happy that we are alive. The, the, the Inquisition, Baruch Hashem, is behind us. Inquisition failed, even though they tried, failed. Recently, there was a tour to Spain, uh, and one of the visits was to the area where the Inquisition was actually signed in the time of the king and queen of Spain in 1492. To the influence of... One second, please, respectfully. But then, yes, we spoke about Cristobal Colón the other day. He was a Jew, correct. 
and many other things. So it says, let's continue, please. This way I don't get a detour uh, in this topic. So it says that when Rabbi Moshe Cordovero uh, passed away, it was shortly after Rabbi Ha'ari arrived to the city of Sfat. And prior to his passing, the students of Rabbi Moshe Cordovero asked Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, who is going to lead us after you leave? It says, don't worry, my replacement is found already in the city of Sfat. And something happened in the burial of Rabbi Moshe Cordovero that the only one that knew what was going on spiritually was Rabbi Hari because he saw a fiery, a, fi a column of fire leading the, 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 the coffin of Rabbi Moshe Cordovero. Rabbi Hari was the only one who saw it. And therefore, the student says, since you are the only one who saw this a godly revelation in the burial of Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, now you're going to become Ha'ari Sheba Habura, the lion among all of us. Upon this, what I just told you, there is a very famous song that I'm sure the Kahal knows it because we sang it yesterday. I believe because this song belongs to Makam Hijaz, which was the tune that we use on Shabbat before Tisha Av. It's not a happy tune song, although I personally love Makam Hijaz because it has a lot of good, beautiful tunes. But one of the famous tunes of Makam Hijaz is the song El Galil. El Galil, El Galil, El Galil. So if you look in the song of books, it says exactly what I just told you. The burial of this Sadiqim. He spread the table for my nation. This is Yosef Karo. Shelomo al Kabetz. Establish the lecha dodi Moshe anav bedarshan. Moshe was humble and the speaker. This is Rabbeinu Moshe al Sheikh. And then says ala ariv megurav. The ari came up to live in the city of Sfat. So imagine yourself, Hamavdil. You have the dream team of Hachamim. Not talking about Messi. I know you're very happy. He scored a goal the other night. Okay, Hazaku Baruch. Okay, the rabbi knows a lot of things. Now, I didn't go see him because it was Shabbat. And I don't think I'm going to go see him even after Shabbat. But imagine yourself the dream team of Hachamim, of the Mekubalim, of the Sephardim in Sfat. Rabbeinu Yosef Karo, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, Rabbeinu Ari, Rabbeinu Shalom Levi al Kabetz, Rabbi Eliezer Askari, Rabbi Moshe al Sheikh. Stand Ashwaye. The Ashkenazim had plenty of good tzaddikim. There is a debate if Rabbi Nuhari was a Faradi or Ashkenazi. So the Ashkenazim said Ashkenazi. The Sephardim was a Faradim, but it doesn't matter. All this is all this is tam, uh, you know, a, a funny thing to say. But at the end of the day, who doesn't follow Rabbi Nuhari? Sephardim, Ashkenazim, Hasidim follow Rabbi Nuhari. Who doesn't follow Rabbi Yosef Karo? Who doesn't follow Rabbi Moshe Cordovero? Who doesn't follow El Rabbeinu Shalom Olevi What do you think? In Ashkenaz synagogues, they don't sing Lechadodi, Likrat Kala. Of course, it's the same prayer. A multi-system, by the way. Okay? So what do you think? They don't follow? Of course they follow. So Sefaradim Ashkenazim is only a reaction of history. Mashiach comes, forget about it. No more Sephardi, no more Ashkenazi, no more Yemenite, no more Yeke. All Yehudim. And everybody will follow one minhag, one tradition. All the differences that we have will be completely removed because we're going to have Bederech Echad Nelech. We're going to have one way suitable for all of Am uh, Israel. Now, when 
Rabbeinu Ha'ari, interesting enough, besides being a master of Torah, Rabbeinu Ha'ari had a certain source of income. What was the income of Rabbeinu Ha'ari? He was a businessman that according to what I see in the biography, he sold spices. What? Spices, like za'atar, like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, um, um, za'atar, no. Um, saffron, all type of condimentos, pimienta, pepper, salt, garlic, sugar, uh, cloves. Oh, this is according to one opinion. And he used to give a shi'ur, in Kabbalah, in one of the local synagogues, that's why if you ever go to Sfat, you have two synagogues of the Ari, the Sephardic synagogue and the Ashkenazic synagogue. So it says that he used to give Shiaurim in the Ashkenazic synagogue, and many people came. Among them was Rabbeinu Yosef eh, Karo. And Rabbeinu Yosef Karo absorbed tremendously the writings and the learnings of Rabbeinu eh, Ha'ari. And it says that the Rabbeinu Ha'ari eh, used to go also to pinpoint where the Kevarim of Sadiqim were found. He knew a lot of things. According to the biography, he even understood the language of, I'll tell you exactly what it says, the palm trees, the animals, the birds, and the uh, domesticated animals as well, and he was able to see the irachamayim of the person by looking at the forehead of the person, even and he was even, you know, familiar with all the concept of Mashiach, which he did not reveal because his generation wasn't ready for that uh, moment. Now, the kever of Rabbeinu Ha'ari, as I said, is found in the ancient kever of Sfat. He's buried next to his son and his mikveh that he used to go every time he was there before he passed away. The mikveh is found at the bottom of the op op mountain. The mikveh is constantly freezing cold and thousands flock to this mikveh as a segula for healing and segula for Teshuvah as well. This is in a nutshell some of the highlights about the life of Rabbeinu Ha'ari. But now let's read matters about the Torah of Rabbeinu Ha'ari. So as I gave you the biography before, so we're moving on to the next uh, level. So says the Benish Hai, and it says that every person should make the effort on the day of the Hilula of Rabbeinu Ha'ari, which Baruch Hashem we do, to learn and to talk about Rabbeinu Ha'ari, and doing so brings kaparat avonot to the neshama of the person. We're not going to Tzfat. We're not going to the mikveh of Tzfat. What are we doing? We're bringing Rabbeinu Ha'ari to us. Honey. Ha'ari, yeah. The lion, yeah, he was the lion. So it goes further and it says that the parents of Rabbeinu Ha'ari, Rabbeinu Shelomo Luria Ashkenazi, and his mother, both of them were holy, holy people. And it says, based on the Shivhe Ha'ari, on the writings of the Benish Hai, that uh, when Rabbeinu Ha'ari was born, He told his father, be careful in the Berit Milah of your son. Don't do the Berit Milah on, <coughs> until, excuse me, you see me standing by the synagogue. Now, can you imagine Eliyahu Navi comes to you and he tells you, when you do the Milah to your son, wait till you see me. This is what the Benish High writes. For me, I accepted. So what does he do? Comes the day of the Berit Milah. The father brings the baby to the synagogue 
and the father is looking to the left and to the right and Eliyahu Navi was not found. The father is waiting and the Mohel was told, wait, but the Kahal doesn't understand. Why don't you start already with the Milah? Everybody's here. The mother is here. The baby is here. You are here. What else do you need? The father did not answer. He waited uh, till Eliyahu Navi came. When Eliyahu Navi arrives, he says to his father, you're going to sit uh, as the Sandak and I'm going to sit next to you. And it says that Rabbeinu Ari's father and Eliyahu Navi were the ones who were holding the baby, but the Mohel did the Berit Mila not knowing that there was someone else sitting next to him. After the uh, Mila took place, he was informed, your son will become one of the greatest lights for all of Am Israel worldwide. A short while later, the father of Rabbi Nohari passed away. That's when they traveled to Egypt at a very young age. He doesn't say how old, probably may have been six, seven, eight years old. But upon arriving to Egypt, he went to the yeshiva. And he learned and he learned and he learned Torah to the point that he was one of the greatest Talmidei Hachamim in Egypt in which he learned a lot of Torah with a lot of Kedusha and he merited often to have the encounter of Eliyahu Navi Zahur Letov until Eliyahu Navi told him your time in Egypt came to an end is now the time for you to go back to Eres Israel. We don't really have the exact time when he went, but based on the biography that I read, it seems that just a few years before Rabbi Nohari passed away, that's when he went back from Egypt to Eres Israel, and there's, we, there's when he returned the, uh, his neshama to Akadosh Baruch Hu. So it says that Rabbeinu the Ben Ishai explains in the name of Rabbeinu Chaim Vital how was possible for Rabbeinu Ha'ari to achieve such a great lofty level of holiness. And it says that for every uh, segment of the Zohar, he will learn for an entire week the same segment and it says not all the time he was given the answer automatically to understand sometimes it took six weeks Mehila, six nights of the week and some of these nights remaining up all night long in order to understand the depth of the zohar rabbi nohari was vatran What's the meaning of Vatran? It says in Ta'ameha Mizvot that for himself, Rabbeinu Ha'ari was a very simple person in the way that he ate and the way that he dressed. That's called Perishut. In other words, whatever his wife made him for him to eat, he will eat. He will not say, oh, I wish you made this. I wish you made that. She gave him cream cheese and bread. He was happy. She gave him cereal and milk. He was happy. Whatever it was, he ate. Beautiful midah. Beautiful midah to have in life. Number one. Number two, his dress code. His dress code was clean, presentable, but simple. Not flashy. Pashut. But it says when came to for his wife, he was very careful that his wife always had elegant garments. And whatever she needed and wanted, he will give her. And even when things were not 
the most colorful for him in honor to in order to honor his wife he will go the extra mile very interesting because you ask yourself why did he do this if sometimes he could not have the means that's what it says here even when sometimes he did not have the means he always kept his wife happy for her to be happy so i think that is imperative to understand that when Rabbeinu Ha'ari does something, it's not like we do something. Rabbeinu Ha'ari, as we mentioned before, was the successor of Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, of Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, Tomer de Bora. That when the students ask Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, who is taking over after you leave the world, he didn't tell them Rabbeinu Ha'ari, he says, you will know, whoever notices something in the day of my passing, that will be the one. And Rabbeinu Ari was the one who saw. But says Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, towards the end of Tomer de Bora, and it says the following. The wife, I'm sure the ladies are going to love this, but the men not. But Rabbi Moshe Cordovero says, that the wife is Hashem's presence in the home. Number one, that's what he writes. And it says that whenever you do something for your wife, you're doing it for a Kadosh Baruch Hu. In other words, he says the following example. You buy a dress for your wife, you're dressing up a Kadosh Baruch Hu. So the Beno Moshe Cordovero says, when you buy a dress for your wife and your wife is happy, it's like you bought a dress for a Kadosh Baruch Hu. It's like you bought, explícale. Por favor, porque las introducciones ahí interrumpen a veces. That's what Rabbeinu Moshe Cordovero writes. So when Rabbi, Rabbeinu Ha'ari, as we mentioned yesterday, yesterday, in the Gemara class, we quoted, which is in Kiddushin, we quoted a Gemara in Masechet Berachot that asks the following question. Ladies, as we know, do not have the same obligation as men to learn Torah. They need to learn Torah, but much more limited. Kashrut, Shabbat, Midot Tovot, Tefillah, etc. And automatically, Misvot of the Torah Many of the misvot, ladies are exempt. And the Gemara asks, if the lady does not have obligation of learning Torah as the men, and the amount of misvot that the lady needs actually to observe are very limited, how the lady, the ladies, so to speak, have the zechut of the Torah, have the zechut of the misvot. So the Gemara gave two answers. Answer number one, Shemegadelot et benehem, the mother is the first line of education in the home, not the husband, the wife, the mother, at, at least in the early years of the child's life. Number two, that the wife protects the husband of sinning outside of the home. She masilot min ahed. When a man is married, a man, a married man has less yeserara in certain areas. Why? because he has the wife waiting for him at home. So perhaps this was what Rabbeinu Hari did. It says, the zechut of my wife, and again, to be married to Rabbeinu Hari is not easy. It's not easy. Can you imagine a wife being married to Rabbeinu Hari? You cannot imagine, because you are businessmen. You don't live the life of Rabbeinu Hari, I don't live the life of Rabbeinu Ari. So Rabbeinu Ari was a heavyweight. Imagine a husband stays up learning Torah six nights a week. Imagine a husband that see your forehead and know what you did. Imagine a husband that eats whatever the wife gives him. Imagine a husband that doesn't argue with the wife. 
This was Rabbeinu Ari. So he says further, uh, in the Yafesi Hatam Shel Sadiqim, and it says as follows. Just one second. This is a heavy duty matter. I'm going to skip it. Very heavy. I'm going to skip it. No, certain things I cannot say. Certain things I should not say. Because I don't want, God forbid, people to misunderstood what the capabilities of Rabbeinu Ari. But guess what? Rabbeinu Ari saved many people's lives. Especially when there were attempts against the Jewish people. Short story, I give you the highlights. In one of the villages, there was a priest that hated the Jewish people. And what did he do? He went to the fish store. He knew that the Yehudim buy fish in honor of Shabbat. And he gave a bribe to this Gentile fish salesperson. And he says, I want you to inject poison in the fish. So when the Jewish people will buy the fish, they will have food poisoning. Especially when the, the rabbi of the Jews come to buy fish, give him the fish that is the biggest, the nicest, and there inject the most amount of poison. This was Rabbi Nohari. He went to see. He says, this Shabbat, nobody eats fish. I'm not going to say more than this. Further, it says, a person who wants to truly experience holiness in life, to train themselves to go to the mikveh. Today, uh, many people go to the mikveh every day, mostly in the Hasidic or Kabbalistic world. Average people may not go to the mikveh every day. Many of us go in honor of Shabbat, in honor of Yom Tov. Some pious men go to the mikveh the morning after the wife went to the mikveh for Tumat Keri, based on Takanat Ezra. But it says a person who wants to achieve holiness of the spirit, it needs to be connected with holiness of the body. A body that is clean, internally and externally it says Rabbi Nuhari, he established this which is part of uh, the halakha but not really we know that there is a halakha that says separation between meat and dairy let's say a person ate meat how many hours you need to wait to have milk Six hours. Hazako Baruch, everybody knows this. Rabbi Nohari had a very interesting tradition. The day that he ate meat will not drink milk. The day that he will have dairy, he will not eat meat. Because he did not want the remote possibility that in the digestive system of the person, meat and milk will meet. This is Rabbi Nohari. You don't have to do this. Halachically, after you waited the six hour period after meat you can have milk without any halachic restriction whatsoever but this was rabbeinu hari so when you eat simple when you go to the mikveh every day when you eat whatever your wife gives you when you learn torah with the, the, the diligence and the dedication that rabbeinu hari had obviously you have a guaranteed return you're going to become a holy person. When Eliyahu Navi is your habruta, when Eliyahu Navi comes and learns Torah with you, when Eliyahu Navi holds your father's hand to do the Berit Milah, when you're able to see this pillar of fire guiding the remains of Rabbeinu Moshe eh, Cordovero, so now you understand why the Ari was called Ha'ari Sheba Habura, the lion of the group of people. Rabbeinu Ha'ari established a takana 
in the Sidur. Thank you. If you look in the Sidur, every Sidur has this, at least Sephardic and Hasidic, and maybe Ashkenaz as well. He established that says, Hareni mekabel alay mizvat This paragraph of the prayer was added by Rabbeinu Hari. It says, I take upon myself the positive commandment of the Torah to love every Jew like I love myself. Why do they establish this? It says, through this paragraph, our tefillah will be elevated together with all of the tefillot of Am Israel. It's right there in the Sidur after Batit Palel Hana before the Akedah. This paragraph established by the one and only Rabbeinu eh, Ha'ari. So we spoke about eh, meat and dairy, tefillah, mikveh. I share with you some short stories and we cover, I think, a lot of the highlights of the life of Rabbeinu eh, Ha'ari. So I think that for today, just talking about the great Rabbeinu Ha'ari, we accomplish our learning for today. Yei Ratzon, that the Zahut of Rabbeinu Ha'ari, the fact that we spend 45 minutes almost learning and talking and reminding ourselves of the great Kedushan Tahara of Rabbeinu Ha'ari, I have no doubts that Rabbeinu Ha'ari is becoming a new advocate for everyone that is here in today's class. You need to know this about all of the Sadiqim. Whenever you speak about the life of the Sadiqim, you light candles, you pray, you learn, you read stories of Sadiqim, the candles are at home. They didn't set it up today, I don't know why. I already lit mine yesterday at home. But you can do it now when you get home. You talk about it, you learn about it. Guess what? The Sadiqim now become your representative in Shamaim. And believe me, to have a representative like Rabbeinu Ha'ari in Shamaim, a day like today, especially in these uh, challenging days of uh, prior to Tisha Av, you know, we heard the Allah of today. This week, you be careful. This week, try to be as careful as you can. Even things that are normal are dangerous. Since Rosh Chodesh, I personally, I have been involved with two community dramas that happen here. Unexpected, unforeseen accidents. Out of nowhere. One in a swimming pool and one in a warehouse. Not normal situations regretfully unfortunately these days are very delicate days are days which i don't want to go too much into this but there are days as we mentioned last week in the name of the benish high that the management and supervision of these days is under a sav management that's what we learn for two and a half days the introduction of the Benish High, explaining how Isav runs from the 17th of Tammuz till Tisha Av. When Isav runs the show of the day, we need to be proactive and we need to be, you know, on the defensive. Be cautious, be careful, do what you need to do, follow the halachot, don't rely on miracles, and Be'ezat Hashem, Yiratzon shenizkebe nechamat Sion. Baruch Adonai le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hananiah ben Akashia Omer. Ratzak Kadosh Baruch Hu.